Without consciousness, what is there? No one experiences anything. It's like, is there, any, is there anything when no one experiences anything? That's the question. And the answer that this book is presenting is that, no, you have to think about consciousness as a constituent element of reality. It's something that's necessary for reality itself to exist. Now, of course, it depends on what you mean by reality. But the reality that's being referred to here, I told you already, is this strange amalgam of the subjective experience and the world. But the question is deeper than that, too, because it is by no means obvious what there is if there's no one to experience it. I mean, the whole notion of time itself seems to collapse, at least in terms of something like felt duration. And then the, the notion of size disappears, essentially, because there's nothing to scale it. And the causality seems to vanish. And so, and, and we don't understand consciousness, not in the least. We don't understand what it is that is in us that gives illumination to being. And what happens in the Old Testament, at least in part, is that that consciousness is associated with the divine. Now you think, well, is that a reasonable proposition? And that's a very complicated question. But at least we might note that there's something to the claim. Because there is a miracle of experience and existence that's dependent on consciousness. I mean, people try to explain it away constantly, but it doesn't seem to work very well. And, and here's something else to think about, I think, that's really worth thinking about. People do not like it when you treat them like they're not conscious. Right? They react very badly to that. And then, you don't like it if someone assumes that you're not conscious, and you don't like it if someone assumes that you don't have free will. You know, that you're just absolutely determined in your, in your actions, and there's nothing that's going to repair you, and that you don't need to have any responsibility for your actions. It's like, our culture, the laws of our culture are predicated on the idea, something like, People are conscious, people have experience, people make decisions and can be held responsible for them, that there's a free will element to it. And you can debate all that philosophically and fine, but the point is, is that that is how we act and that is the idea that our legal system is predicated on. And there's something deep about it because, you know, you're subject to the law, but the law is also limited by you, which is to say that in, in a well-functioning, properly grounded, democratic system. You have intrinsic value. That's the source of your rights. Even if you're a murderer, we have to say, the law can only go so far because there's something about you that's divine. Well, what does that mean? Well, partly it means that there's something about you that's conscious and capable of communicating, like you're a whole world in, unto yourself. And you have that to contribute to everyone else, and that's valuable. I mean, that you can learn new things, you can transform the structure of society, you can invent a new way of dealing with the world. You're capable of all that. It's an intrinsic part of you, and that's associated with this. It's associated, that's the idea there, is that there's something about the logos that is necessary for the absolute chaos of the reality beyond experience to manifest itself as reality. That's an amazing idea because it gives consciousness a constitutive role in the cosmos. And you can debate that, but you know, it's not, you can't just bloody well brush it off. Because first of all, we are the most complicated things there are that we know of by, by a massive, by, by a massive amount. We're so complicated that it's unbelievable. And so, you know, there's a lot of cosmos out there, but there's a lot of cosmos in here, too. And which one is greater is by no means obvious, unless you use something trivial like relative size, which, you know, really isn't a very sophisticated approach. And whatever it is that is you has this capacity to experience reality and to transform it, which is a very strange thing, you know. You can conceptualize a future in your imagination, and then you can work and make that manifest. You participate in the process of creation. That's one way of thinking about it. And so that's why I think in, in Genesis 1, it, re, it, it, it relates the idea that human beings are made in the image of the divine, men and women, which is interesting too, because, you know, the feminists are always criticizing Christianity, for example, as being, um, what, inexorably patriarchal. Of course, they criticize everything like that, so it's, it's hardly a stroke of bloody brilliance. But... I think it's an absolute miracle that right at the beginning of the document it says straightforwardly, like with no hesitation whatsoever, that 
the divine spark, which we're associating with the word that brings forth being, is manifest in men and women equally. That's a very cool thing. And you've got to think, well, like I said, you, you actually take that seriously. Well, what you've got to ask is, what happens if you don't take it seriously? Right? That, that's, read, read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. That's the best, the best investigation of that tactic that's ever been produced. Because what happens in Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment is that the main character, whose name is Raskolnikov, decides that there's no intrinsic value to other people. And that as a consequence, he can do whatever he wants. It's only cowardice that stops him from acting. Right? Because well, why would it be anything else if, other if the value of other people is just an arbitrary superstition? Then why can't I do exactly what I want when I want? Which is the psychopath's viewpoint. Well, so Raskolnikov does. He kills someone who's a very horrible person and he has very good reasons for killing her. And he's half starved and a little bit insane and possessed by this ideology. It's brilliant, brilliant layout. And he finds out something after he kills her, which is that the post-killing Raskolnikov and the pre-killing Raskolnikov are not the same person even a little bit. Because he's broken a rule, like he's broken a serious rule and there's no going back. And crime and punishment is, is, is a is the best investigation I know of, of what happens if you take the notion that there's nothing divine about the individual seriously.